Brian Danielson, or Daniel Bryan in regards to the following story, is one of the most beloved and revered modern era professional wrestlers. Fans are left spellbound by his exemplary technical wrestling skills while also identifying with his playful and earnest humanity. Bryan is held in such high esteem by a large portion of the general wrestling audience that those fans would move heaven and earth to see him enjoy the spoils befitting of a top champion. And in 2014, when it appeared that WWE was overlooking the most popular star on their show, wrestling fans the world over made their voices heard. I'm Jack from Cultaholic, and this is the true story of the Yes Movement. From the time Brian Danielson inverted his name to become Daniel Bryan in WWE, he embarked on a WWE run unlike any before or since. Bryan went from heralded indie icon with an unclear mainstream ceiling to headline fodder upon rumours that he might jump to a national competitor 11 years later. That's quite a career arc for someone that debuted as part of a silly reality-based game show in 2010. It was on the premiere broadcast of NXT that clean-shaven 28-year-old Daniel Bryan faced newly crowned world champion Chris Jericho in what will probably be the best match of the season by a wide margin. Though they'd never worked together before, Jericho knew what Bryan was capable of and the two put together a rather ambitious TV outing. Reflecting later on his first thoughts of Bryan, Jericho wrote, I knew he would get over big as he'd done it many times before in Ring of Honor and New Japan. Once you learned how to get over, you could do it anywhere. Jericho wasn't wrong. Despite going zero for forever on NXT, Brian endeared himself well to the WWE audience. Both the fans previously aware of his rare greatness, as well as the viewers whose only wrestling intake was WWE. When Brian was temporarily let go over that Justin Roberts strangling incident, fans were outraged. When Brian's match with Sheamus was bumped from WrestleMania 27's main card, they expressed annoyance. When he became World Heavyweight Champion via Money in the Bank cash-in, there was a widespread feeling of ecstasy. And when a heel turned, Brian lost the belt in 18 seconds seconds to Seamus, well, they didn't take too kindly to that. In the year that followed that confounding bit of booking, Brian made the best of a curious partnership with Kane that centered on each man's anger issues. They did meet in anger management sessions after all, as they cultivated a grudging love-hate relationship. Their interactions were often very funny and provided some necessary character quirks to the well-rounded technician. And while fans had come to appreciate Brian's comic sensibilities, many caught on to his quirkiness earlier as they'd already taken to performing his signature gesture along with him. After winning the World Heavyweight title in late 2011, Brian was encouraged to be as over the top and cheerful as possible and let fan reaction determine the direction of his character from there. To achieve this directive, Brian co-opted a habit of one of his favorite MMA fighters, then UFC welterweight Diego Sanchez. Sanchez would make his entrance by repeatedly pumping his fist and shouting the word yes to enforce a positive mindset for himself. Brian took that emphatic yes and added an over-the-top sideways gallop, which he'd performed down the entrance ramp, all the while spiking his index fingers skywards with each affirmative. While it seemed like this taunt was designed to make Brian into an unlikable douche, fans did catch on to it. There was an infectious energy that would manifest whenever the opening bars of Brian's Wagnerian rock opera was pumped through the arena, and the taunt complemented that vibe. Soon, crowds were yesing along with Brian even after he was turned heel. And once a heel, when an increasingly unhinged Brian tried to get crowds to stop with the yesing, countered with a big no gesture, the yeses continued anyway, and apparently played a part in his character's mental spiral. Despite this attempt to quite inorganically make the yes chants something they weren't, Brian still had his following, and a vocal contingent continued supporting him through rivalries and issues with Sheamus, CM Punk, AJ Lee, Kane, or whoever stepped up to the plate to face he and Kane when they were teaming up. And while some of Brian's other peers in group therapy later found the strength to reach for the sky, Brian was about to launch deeper into the stratosphere. During the summer months of 2013, after Team Hell No had run its course, Brian began earning the loudest crowd responses on any given show. Fan faith was rewarded as Brian stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with the likes of The Shield, Randy Orton, Christian, Sheamus, and others, oftentimes winning in featured bouts. That July, when WWE Champion John Cena hand-selected Brian to be his SummerSlam 
SummerSlam opponent, there was a very real sense that Brian was being made. The Rockstar responses to Brian had only increased in volume, and it felt like WWE was finally acknowledging that. Yes was now more than just Brian's personal catchphrase, it had become the affirmative of choice for a fan base that was more used to trolling lukewarm WWE product with a droning, what? So 2013 Daniel Bryan really felt like a more positive revelation. Bryan did go on to defeat Cena in an instant classic of a match at the 2013 SummerSlam to win the WWE title. However, his reign was very short-lived, as guest referee Triple H and briefcase-toting Randy Orton ambushed the exhausted victor, facilitating his immediate title loss. The storyline mirrored what many perceived to be the maddening reality. Normal-sized, modestly human Brian was internally viewed as far too human to represent WWE as the face of the outfit, as WWE often preferred to promote giants with million-dollar smiles that were ripped from the pages of the latest graphic novel. Seeing as Brian looked a bit more like the bass player in a local cover band, he wasn't exactly the company's champion archetype. Instead, he was a B-plus player, a label that Stephanie McMahon placed upon him at the onset of the angle. But fans rallied behind Brian in what became a man versus the machine story. At three consecutive pay-per-views, Brian and Orton faced off for the WWE title, with screwiness playing a part in all three finishes. Brian won the belt back at Night of Champions, but then had to forfeit it the next night due to referee shenanigans. Neither man then won the vacated title at the horrifically booked battleground due to a big show run-in, or lumber in. And then finally, Orton won the belt back at Hell in a Cell via more official shenanigans on the part of guest referee Shawn Michaels. And this seemed to finish Brian's rendezvous with the main event scene, as Big Show was slotted in as Orton's next challenger, with the seven-footer now taking the yes chant for himself. Apparently, weirdly, someone in WWE believed that it wasn't Brian that was over, but rather the yes chant itself that was over, regardless of who did it. Which is like that episode of The Simpsons when they hold the heroes parade for the inanimate carbon rod instead of Homer for using the rod to seal the capsule door shut, except this wasn't funny this time. With all due respect to Paul White, Brian was very much the fan's choice of the day, and to have him anywhere outside the main event felt like a slap in the face. The B-plus player angle hit a little bit too close to the nerve for fans who had now grown tired of the machinations of the one and only legitimate mainstream American promotion of the day. And don't say the TNA was a competitor, because at this point, they were scaring AJ Styles away with a substantial pay cut. AJ Styles. Despite the office viewpoint, many fans saw Brian as more than just a face in the crowd. This was very much apparent in Seattle, two hours away from Brian's stated hometown of Aberdeen, Washington, when a raw taping in the Emerald City concluded with a symbolic belt raising ahead of Cena and Orton's unification match six nights later. The ring was filled with many ex-world champions for this segment, but Brian outshined them all, earning a deafening response that briefly derailed the intended flow of the segment. And for his part, typically humble Brian could only laugh a little bit as it was all going down. The following day in San Jose, WWE held a press conference to announce 2015's WrestleMania 31 for Levi's Stadium in nearby Santa Clara. Though a great many WWE luminaries were on hand for the presser, Brian was conspicuously not among them, a fact noted by some of the question askers in attendance. John Cena took the occasion to acknowledge Brian's absence, as well as acknowledging the uniqueness of the reaction the night before for the popular wrestler. While Cena seemingly had no problem discussing Brian's popularity, there were apparently some higher-ups in WWE that didn't like being dictated to by the crowd. But maybe, just maybe, think this through for a second, maybe the person behind the Yes chants were more popular than the chant itself. Big Show's main event run faded quickly, but as that push subsided, Brian was taking his lumps from the Wyatt family in the upper mid card. It wasn't the worst idea, seeing as the Wyatts were a hot act when they were first called up. However, it really galled many fans when a battered and beaten Brian submitted his reluctant loyalty to the group in exchange for them not beating him up anymore. It sadly seemed very apropos to end 2013 with one last debasement of an organic fan favourite. While Brian did later write that his willingness to join the group was intended to be him plotting to tear it apart from within, fans at the time really groaned at this setup. After all, they'd learned by now not to necessarily trust WWE's storytelling methods. But rather than have this plan to destroy the Wyatts play out slowly over time, Brian was turned back babyface very quickly. 
Just two weeks after pledging himself to the group, Brian turned on the Wyatts at the end of the January 13th episode of Raw, attacking the bearded trio after a cage match gone awry. The response from the Providence crowd for the sudden turn was foundation shaking, and their mass yes chanting made for an unforgettable sight. And again, with all respect to the Big Show, it wasn't him who was getting this kind of adulation when he briefly took over the chant. This rushed split of Brian and the Wyatt family may have been facilitated by something that happened at a college basketball game one week earlier. The Michigan State Spartans football team was being honored at halftime of the Spartans basketball game on their home court at the Breslin Center, when basketball player Travis Jackson led the crowd in a big collective yesing for their fellow team. The unbelievable scene made it onto ESPN Sports Center, while other media outlets also picked up on the moment, explicitly crediting Daniel Bryan as the inspiration. Now, possibly because of this, kind of becomes pretty hard to justify having Brian tool around as a lackey in a gray jumpsuit. This was free publicity in the mainstream and a clear indication that Brian's influence had extended beyond the arena. Not that any of that helped him much in the short term. Though his immense popularity was more than obvious, Brian went on to lose to Bray Wyatt in a very good opening match at the 2014 Royal Rumble event in Pittsburgh. Oh yes, the Royal Rumble, the event that determines, remember, who challenges for the world title and basically, usually, who main events at WrestleMania. Well, later that night was Orton and Cena's WWE title bout, the latest match in their best of 7,000, and it was fairly by the numbers. In fact, it was so by the numbers that the crowd in Pittsburgh dumped all over it, with one irritated chant after another, including the dreaded, this is awful. But that response, that was kind of child's play compared to the Rumble match itself. Because there were still several open slots for surprise entrants, many hoped that Brian, who had not been announced as a participant, would pop up in the Rumble match as well. After all, he was arguably the most popular star in the company at the time, and it'd be quite foolish not to have him headline WrestleMania, right? One by one, the entrants hit the ring, some more serious contenders than others, none of which were a bearded man with maroon tights and kick pads over his boots. And then number 30 came around, and when Rey Mysterio hit the ring, all hell broke loose. Daniel Bryan was not in this Royal Rumble, and the crowd in Pittsburgh responded with a sustained torrent of boos that basically pissed all over the remaining field. The winner of the match ended up being Batista, who'd only just turned back up one week earlier after three and a half years away. The plan was for Batista to challenge Randy Orton for the WWE title at WrestleMania 30, which the WWE audience um, wasn't really up for. Fans continued to react with outrage after the fact, flooding social media with their disgust. And it wasn't just the fans, Mick Foley himself blistered WWE's tone deafness in his own written rant. In fairness, it wasn't Batista's fault, nor was it Rey Mysterio's fault for entering the Rumble at number 30. WWE had simply massively misread the room, overlooking the clear and obvious fan favorite. In fact, Brian was pretty far down the WrestleMania depth chart based on the original plans. Beneath Batista versus Orton, Taker versus Lesnar, Triple H versus CM Punk, and John Cena versus Bray Wyatt was Brian facing his old nemesis Sheamus in a match that didn't have any momentum to it at the time. At best, it just seems like a chance for Brian to right the wrong from two years earlier, albeit far removed from the main event. It wasn't exactly an idea to induce excitement. But then, as they often do, plans changed. The day after the Rumble, CM Punk infamously walked out of WWE, owed to the many simmering issues accumulated over time. This upset the balance of WrestleMania as Punk was supposed to go over on Triple H on the show of shows. The initial remedy seemed to be slotting Brian into Punk's place into that match with Triple H to pay off the feud that kicked off at SummerSlam when Triple H was the referee with the rise of the cumbersome authority. And while the idea of Brian brutalizing the main face of the WWE office may have satisfied some fans, there was still the issue of the Orton versus Batista main event, mainly the possibility that the fans were treated like Goldberg versus Lesnar from 10 years earlier and spent half the match cheering for the referee. Although in fairness, Mike Yoda does deserve to have 70,000 fans chanting his name, doesn't he? We all love a bit of Mike. Fans have booed top baby faces before, and negative responses to John Cena became an ironic pseudo sport unto itself. But there was nothing at all playful this time around. This was the fans really believing that they were being messed around, and the tone of their response reflected that. The fans identified with Brian and wouldn't accept anything less than the man they believed deserved the spotlight most getting to enjoy those rewards. The outrage might have fizzled out in other circumstances, but this time, it really persisted. In the weeks ahead, crowds aired their vocal displeasure at live roars, cheering Brian loudly while booing Batista and openly disdaining everything else associated with the world title picture. This was the exact opposite of the fandangoing craze from a 
year earlier, as the company couldn't turn this response into some kind of net positive. Unless, of course, they took a big step and rerouted the booking. As February turned into March, there seemed to be changes in the offing. The supposedly virtuous Batista helped lay Brian out in one instance, a sign that perhaps Drax the Destroyer was not the ultimate hero in this WrestleMania 30 story. It appeared that the final nail in Batista's babyface coffin was the negative response he got during his match with Alberto Del Rio at Elimination Chamber. Pittsburgh and the Royal Rumble was no fluke because Minneapolis was firmly on the big Dave hate train as well. And all the points between the pay-per-view dates seemed to have firmly a similar disinterest in seeing Batista being the one to chase Randy Orton's gold. With WWE realizing that there'd be no way to get a salvageable WrestleMania main event without injecting their most cheered wrestler in the company at the time, they did what they've often had to do in recent years, weave unpleasant reality into the ongoing story. On the March 10th Raw in Memphis, Tennessee, Brian staged a protest of sorts by having a sea of supporters gate crash the ringside area, filling the squared circle in an act of defiance. Brian made it clear that the show was being held up until he got his demand, a match at WrestleMania with that saboteur Triple A. Helmsley and Stephanie tried to put an end to the demonstration to no avail. With his anger increasing, a furious Triple H was goaded into not only accepting Brian's challenge, but also an additional challenge, the right to be added to the WrestleMania World title match should he beat Triple H earlier in the night. From there, even the most pessimistic of fans could possibly see the happy ending on the horizon. WWE's hand was forced, and they were finally caving to popular demand. And after all, this was the first WrestleMania and main roster pay-per-view that would air on the brand new WWE Network. The last thing they needed at a moment like this was to do something that would anger their prospective customer base. Well, they, they sort of did that anyway by having Brock Lesnar end the Undertaker's streak, but at least that didn't go on last. And so, Brian did win his two matches at WrestleMania 30 inside the New Orleans Superdome. First defeating Triple H in quite a highly scientific opening match before overcoming the odds to beat both Orton and Batista in a wild triple threat main event. Michael Cole declared it the miracle on Bourbon Street, though a better name would have maybe been the only ending that would actually suffice. Unfortunately, Brian's reign didn't really pan out afterwards, thanks to a significant neck injury. He was forced to abdicate the gold in June and didn't return to the ring until the following January. He came back just in time for another debacle involving a Royal Rumble, a hostile Pennsylvania-based crowd, and an undesirable winner, but that's kind of another story for another time. Still, Brian's triumph on the bayou has been cemented as a heartwarming WrestleMania memory. For many fans, its significance rings louder because they know that they had a part in making it happen to some extent. Batista was sadly a victim of bad timing, coming along for a rejuvenated short-term run at the top before sheer volume from the fans kind of slayed the Leviathan. Mind you, we can't feel too sorry for him because he's done quite well for himself since. Since then, similar fan hijackings haven't been as successful. With the exception to the ending of WrestleMania 31 a year later, Roman Reigns' almost unabated babyface push through the latter half of the decade resulted in a prolonged standoff where WWE still pushed their guy while the fans, while booing heavily, kind of just had to accept the way things were. And that's because there was no other main wrestling promotion as a competitor, not until 2019 anyway. The circumstances that led Daniel Bryan to the WWE title at WrestleMania 30 are completely unique. Lightning in a bottle fan support, full-scale audience rejection of creative direction, further rejection of the hand-picked hero, and the exodus of a rabble-rousing anti-authoritarian, CM Punk, all helped configure the realignment of the WrestleMania picture and its storybook ending. And to the fans who got what they wanted on April 6, 2014, if you were to ask them if all the mind-numbing twists and turns leading up to that moment were really worth it, they might just answer you with one specific word. I've been Jack from Cultaholic, and that was the true story of the Yes Movement.